And the same trip on the way back to Ungava Bay from Labrador coast, um, <clears throat> his great-grandfather, and he wouldn't be able to walk anymore because they were starving. His uh, hunting is very poor. And his grandfather, and he was weak. He getting too weak because nothing to eat. And they had to leave. He's a great grandfather. Just left it for good. And before he died, they knew they wouldn't be able to make it, make this trip to the uh, in Angava Bay. George Aranak tells about his grandfather. His translator is George Koniak. This is a true story, an Eskimo story of less than a hundred years ago. Many like it are told by other Eskimo families across the Canadian Arctic. And then after, week after, after they leaving the father, and his great-grandmother told son, and my, <clears throat> my son, uh, you better kill me and uh, eat me, then uh, you can go longer, longer trip. You may not gonna be far as I gonna make if you not eat me, because there's nothing to eat. And then the son and the told mother, and I can't do that, and I can't kill you, mother, and I'm gonna die with you. What's, that's the time the end comes and we're going to be together. So his mother said, this, uh, <clears throat> you're not supposed to, you're not, you shouldn't do that. And we're going to be die together and then uh, we got no more family alive. If you eat me, you may have, to, you may make the trip and into the, back to the uh, Angava Bay. If you meet some people over there, they make and help you, and you grow some more, more, uh, more family. Kila, nak nak iya aku malam itu ilo anak suni, itu bego ilo anak suni. Kau mita aku malam dalam sila mit suni, sila mit tu mian ni mana, tu aku pat nak nak tu ina lata bening tu aku malam. Nen. And she trying hard to make her son to kill the her. And, and he, she tell the son again, please my son and put the rope on my neck and right through the snow house. You can standing outdoors and then you can't see me. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't see me when I was suffering. And please and put the rope on my neck right through the snow house and then pull it outside, and then hang me inside the snow house. And then uh, the man and <clears throat> the, the mother's son, and then uh, eat the mother. And then after a while, and he's got more strength for walking. He's all by himself is walking. They were started out with the family, and then this is the only one left, and he's carry on and carrying that mother a leg. Isa magi jau le kami ini kinguwan kinguwan ka jo masih majang kami soalan mata aklat suka lagi jau cuti atingin pisau ngul le kami buat dini. This uh, this is the bad thing to do. It's a very sad story. Even the people are now. When they hear the story, it's just a very, uh, very, very 
sad story. However, that man survived. And then he got married. And then he says he got a children. And that's how the uh, Ananax family and start to grow again. And uh, that's why the, so a lot of the children at George River where he's live. <laughs> live with other Eskimo families at the George River, which flows to the Arctic coast of Angava Bay. Their closest neighbors are at the tiny settlement of Fort Chimo, a hundred miles to the west. Montreal is almost a thousand miles south. Early in 1959, a government party flew to the George River because the 150 people living there wanted to move. Their land had not provided them with a way to make a living. Most times, there was not even enough to eat. Sometimes, in desperation, they traveled five days by dog team to Fort Chimo to draw relief rations. Reluctantly, they decided they must leave their land and go somewhere else. They had been living too close to starvation for too long. The great herds of caribou were no more, and a man might set his traps all winter and get nothing. And so all the men of the George River went to a meeting for three days with the Kadlunas, the white men. Men like Elijah Sam Ananak, Long Joseph Morgan, Willie Etok, Ned E. Mudluck, and Stanley and George Ananak went to find out if there was any way the people could stay at the George River, if there were any new ideas that would help them to earn a living there. Some of the children had traveled 50 miles by dog team with their parents. Maggie, the blind woman, walked a mile across the frozen bay to be there. Even Lavina, the sick woman, came to the meeting. So the two groups of strangers sat down to talk. In a way, it was as if all the George River people and all the white men were in the witness stand at one time. You know this land far better than we'll ever know it. But we know that you want to stay in this place, and we think there are ways that you can do that, and probably have a better living than you've ever had before. One of the ways that you could do that is by making better use of the trees you've got here. Most Eskimos in the north have no trees in the places where they live. And so in a way, you're, you're lucky. And we could talk about the ways in which you could make use of the trees that are here. The success of the meeting turned on one man, an Eskimo who could speak the language of the white man. And so, through him, people began to talk. <laughs> Can you tell me 
വിവറിലെ നമ്മളെ സഫാലോളക്കോ white men had talked of dreams and plans before but what had happened could they be trusted now It is sometimes hard to trust a stranger when the things he speaks of are new. Now you know that your nearest neighbors at Port Burwell have no trees at all. They have no wood for firewood and they have no long trees for making sled runners from and they have no wood to build anything with. We were talking with them just a day or two ago and they said to us when you're at the George River would you ask the people there about something that we've been thinking about We need the wood that they have at the George River and we know that the people there have no food in the winter time quite often They have no food for themselves and they have no food for the dogs. And at Port Burwell, there's lots of food, lots of seals. And the people there thought that if you gave them some trees and some wood, that they would be able to give you some meat for yourselves and meat for your dogs. And that way you'd both be better off. Now every March, when the snow is still hard enough to make travel easy by dog team, All the George River men set out for their logging camps, a hundred miles inland along the river. The first year, the men went alone. Since then, three girls have gone with them every spring to cook and manage the camp. The men feel better. loggers now working on a piecework basis with 3000 trees to cut and haul and drive but they still keep some of the old ways they like best each spring not far from where they cut the black spruce now the george river men used to hunt caribou they still do that taking a day off now and then to get meat for the camp <laughs> Thank you. 
first 70 miles of the drive are the easiest, for the river does the work. Closer to Angava Bay, where the world's highest tides have been recorded, it becomes more difficult. 20 miles from the mouth, there's a 20-foot drop in tide. And the long liner, a combination of freighter and fishing boat, which is on loan to the George River people, has trouble hauling the logs against the rising water. You've told us that you all want to come to live together in one place, that you've never been able to do that before because you always had to be out hunting and fishing. This is something that people all over the world like to do, to live together in one place. And like you said to us earlier, they like to live in houses when they have the chance to do that. Some of you have already told us that you want to build the houses from the logs that you have here. And that's a, a good idea because you know how uncomfortable it can be in the wintertime in the tents and how the children are sometimes cold and how tents in the spring are wet and not very good for the old people here. So if you all decide that you want to build your houses, we can talk about the best kind of housing that there might be and about the ways of getting the logs here and of cutting all the lumber that you'll need with your sawmill. When you decided that you wanted to have houses, you mentioned that you wouldn't be able to live in them all summer long because in the summertime you like to go down to the place where the fishing is. Well, that's not going to present any sort of a problem at all because you'll still be able to go down there with your families in the summertime and leave the houses behind. As a matter of fact, you probably would have to do that because a man can't come home 30 miles every day in a boat. It's too far and it costs too much money. So in the summer, just as you always have done, you'll be able to take your tents with you and go down to the mouth of the river and start fishing there. In winter, every dog earns his keep. In summer, they're a nuisance. Only the females with pups go to be fed at the fish camp. The rest are left behind to look after themselves. South, people eat most of their meals at home, but sometimes they go to places where they pay other people to buy the food and pay them to 
cook it for them. They call places like that restaurants. We've been talking to some of the people in the South who own these places, these restaurants. And they say that they think it's quite funny that you should not only eat that fish yourselves, but should feed it to the dogs. They say that's like feeding money to the dogs. If you wanted to try to sell the Arctic char in the South, you could borrow the money for the equipment, for a freezer and for boats and for the nets that you'd need. And we could arrange for a ship to come here and put the fish from your freezer into the one that's on the boat and take all the fish to the south and sell it there. Now the George River people are logging and running a sawmill, building small boats for sale to other northern communities, and catching and processing fish for sale in the south. Through their newly established cooperative, they've borrowed the money to obtain the equipment they need. They've been learning how to use their land in a new way. But part of the process of learning is involving them in other, newer things. They're hearing for the first time about interest on loans and amortization of capital and incorporation fees and statutory reserve funds. Then there are advertising charges and broker's fees and transportation charges. All of them new things to the George River people. We have a custom in the South that when we are going to elect people for some important jobs, we are all given pieces of paper and we write on those pieces of paper the names of the man that we think will be the best for the job. And then we fold them up and we put them into a box. That may seem like a funny idea, but it makes sure that everybody has privacy, that only the man who writes the name on the piece of paper knows whose name he's written on it. It was their first election, and they were voting for the president and five directors of their cooperative, the first Eskimo-run cooperative in Canada. Perhaps it was to be expected that in this first election, some men would vote for themselves, as some did. But wasn't that really just part of the whole process of learning how to make their own decisions and carry their new responsibilities? First elected was Stanley Ananak. He will gradually take over the management of the fishery and the logging. And George Ananak. He was the first elected president of the George River Eskimo Co-op. The terrible story of his family's past will never be told of this or future generations. <laughs> 